Hi, uh, welcome to 7.2, where we're going to be talking about use cases and use the lecture over use cases and user stories um, in relation to requirements. Um, so again, we've just kind of finished a lecture on looking at requirements most broadly, and now it's a very specific lecture lecture on how do you capture them. You know, what are some specific ways to actually capture those requirements because you could just write them down you know like we could go through an activity like that together where we just write a whole bunch of requirements down as plain text but there's some standardized ways out there to capture um, some of those goals and habits and everything else from the elicitation process so let's have a look at both use cases and user stories now in the world of um, requirements analysis, requirements engineering. We have a priority these days, more than ever in fact, to capture things in a very human way. This has been a, like a growing trend, um, I'd say over the last, I don't know, 10 to 20 years where, you know, you look at the ADRs, the, the road legal stuff I put up earlier on like one end of the spectrum and it's like, okay, that's very inhuman. You know, it's very kind of sterile, mathematical, um, and then on the other end, you have things like maybe a requirement could be that, um, you know, this app needs the user to feel like they're accomplishing something, you know, it's like, what does that mean? Well, it's very human, but here's the thing. Most times, not always, most times, many of you are going to work with a set of requirements to solve a problem. You're going to be doing that to solve a problem for a person. And that person is a real, you know, thinking, feeling human. So we're going to look at use cases, user stories. This all falls under the requirements analysis part of uh, the SDLC, but it also is used very commonly in the design part as well. Uh, so when you're actually looking at design, you do look at the requirements and think, what's the actual you know set of goals we need to do, and then we build a software system around it. Because you can kind of understand design as you know building the software system, dictated like figuring out the right high level conceptual way to build a system coming from those requirements. So oh, I've got these the other way around. Um, so we're going to start off with user stories. Now you might have heard of these before. They became really popular in the world of agile and um, you know, that whole Atlassian gold rush, uh, Trello, Jira, everything else. User stories are a method of requirements engineering used to inform the development process and what features to build with the user at the center. Right, that's the most important part with the user at the center. So they are a just a certain way of writing a requirement. They are, there's nothing schmancy fancy about them at all. It's just like rather than writing something kind of really boring and sterile, it's a way of describing a requirement from the perspective of an end user. So we, we try and we try and write yeah, bake them in from the get go. Now, in terms of the structure of user stories, if you're writing a requirement for a user story, it tends to follow this pattern, which is that um, as a type of user, I want to achieve a goal for this reason. That's that's kind of the common structure of it. And why this matters is because we mentioned that <coughs> use cases and user stories come up in the uh, analysis part of requirements engineering after you've done the elicitation. Because if you've talked to students, you know, and you, you talked about you know it, what ways can we improve UNSW for you, and they come to you and they say things like. Um, I want to be able to purchase monthly parking passes online. You could write that down as a requirement, right? Like, so what, what could you do here? You could say, well, let's write that down. Um, a student shall be able to purchase monthly parking passes online. <coughs> you could go that one better and say, you know, why? Again, think about X, Y problem. It's like, why do you need to be able to purchase them online? And they say, oh, because I don't want to, I hate purchasing them in person or I don't like purchasing them online every day and that could help refine your requirements. But let's say that this is a requirement itself. If you wanted to write this as a story, as a user story, you could rewrite it as, as a student, that's the category of person who you're engaging with. I want to purchase a parking pass. That's the goal, right? If they purchase the parking pass, tick, you've achieved it. You've, that's the definition of success. You have succeeded. And then the reason so that I can drive to school. That one's really important because a lot of kind of classic requirements analysis often omits that and it just kind of can write things down as like, you know, this is what needs to be done. Um, this is what a, a consumer end user needs. But 
understanding the reason why it matters is really important. So again, the growing trend towards engineers, designers, you know, system engineers, like software engineers, actually understanding the motivation behind the goal definition is considered really important now. Whether it's written formally as this user story structure or not, like understanding the, the what motivates them is super important because you think about how much, you know, this kind of comes into everything from visual design to, to engineering uh, development. Um, it, it really helps paint the picture. So that's the structure of user stories. Um, they're written in non-technical language. They're not meant to really, they're not meant to be like the ADRs that I showed you earlier. Where it's like, you know, this and this, they need to be able to, you know, purchase it monthly online, but, you know, assuming the service has an uptime of 99.9% .9 or, you know, purchase monthly parking passes at any time of day or this URL, it's, it's again, it's meant to be very kind of high level, non-technical and user goal fo focused, not on product feature focused. So where possible, you want to make the goal as problem, um, as problem focused as you can and not solution focused. So maybe this is the problem that there needs to be a parking pass purchase. But think about this. It's like you could have this required in another way. As a student, I want to purchase um, a parking ticket on the UNSW website. Maybe that's what they say to you. But it's like maybe they've just said that because that's where they just assume that it should go. But in actual fact, they just want to be able to purchase it quickly. You know, I want to be able to, you know, with access to the internet, I want to be able to purchase a parking pass. Maybe that'd be better done on an app. Maybe that'd be better done on a website. Like, who knows? Maybe that could be done at the actual pay at the entrance with a tap. Like, you know, you want to keep these goal focused. Sorry, I went the wrong way. You want to keep these goal focused, not on feature focus. Because one thing that end users will always tend to do is to tell you what features they want. And your job is to extract that out like we mentioned before. And user stories are no different. Um, you'll see this come up in iteration three too, which we'll talk about kind of briefly tomorrow because in iteration three, uh, we do actually do a little bit of um, uh, requirements analysis. Well, we do a little bit of requirements and design essentially. Um, so we like this because it keeps the problem focused. It keeps the customer at the center. Um, and we probably won't do that building. Oh, maybe we'll do that to-do list activity actually. Um, Blake says, how does the reason, you know, how does the reason affect the later design? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the, the simplest, the two simple examples I could probably give you there are that, um, you know, if someone says I want to purchase a parking pass so that I can drive to school, you think about someone who's doing all the comms or the, the copy or the, the visual design you know, maybe the the angling of how all that's conveyed is, you know, like um, beat the bus or, uh, you know, um, get to like get to university even quicker now or something like that. Because if you can understand, like, you know, if, if this website's not about, um, I mean, there's a great, I mean, a bunch of you would have seen it, but there's a great, um, it's a great Simon Sinek talk. It's an old Ted, is it old Ted video? I don't remember. I've seen, I saw it once many years ago. Yeah, it's, a, it's an old Ted one. Um, this is kind of, I think when he was, I think this was one of the things that made it famous. Anyway, he talks about like, start with the why, this is what the talk is. Um, he talks about like from a communication perspective, people tend to respond most to the why. Why you're doing something or why something exists and then it's the how it works and then it's the what it is um, You know in the case study, I think generally used there were like Apple Apple computers um, I'm not a massive Apple fan, but you know, I get the I, I get the appeal right because it's like well You don't you don't build a website saying, you know Parking easy parking because that's all cool, but it's like, you know, why are you doing that? Why do they care? Like, you know, people don't wake up every day saying I want to park easier like no one wakes up every day saying, God, I really want to eat um, broccoli. I mean, some of you might, but people wake up and say, I want to be healthy. You know, like that's the why. So to your question, Blake, how does this affect the later design? It affects it because, um, you know, even though you can help them achieve their goal, maybe you can actually paint a broader picture around it in terms of design. In terms of the engineering front, um, sometimes it just helps ask questions in the team around well, if this is just for parking and they're just trying to get to uni quicker, maybe we should have some other cap. Maybe we, we maybe we could build in some other capabilities early on. So the short answer there is sometimes it can help you potentially future-proof things a little bit. 
I think future proofing is somewhat overrated generally, but um, but yeah. Uh, well, it says uh, just a bit curious. The story we made for the student implies that they could buy only day passes. They, if they could only buy day passes, they would not be satisfied, which is not the case. Is this fine or not? Well, I don't know. You'd kind of have to talk to the student. This is kind of just a a made up example. Like you could talk to them and they say, oh. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I want to buy day passes too. It's just like monthly is like the most common one. And you're like, oh, cool. Well, let's change what the... Or maybe I'll write two user stories. As a student, I want to purchase a, a day parking pass so that I can drive to school occasionally. You know, and then the other user stories, as a student, I want to purchase a monthly parking pass so that I can drive to school regularly. Um, or something similar. Uh, oh, sorry that I missed that one, dear. Right? So... Um, says, to what extent do you go to when writing requirements? If you have some foresight and see areas that are outside the current scope but will be required later on, do you still present them? Uh, that's a good question. So just to recap for everyone, that question was like, you know, do you only work with what you have or do you think deeper than it? Um, if you have suspicions about what might be needed in the future, your job is to elicit that information from people. So I guess the short answer I could give you is that a set of requirements should come from what stakeholders have asked for, not from your intuition, the vast majority of the time. Um, but if you feel like something's missing, it's kind of your job to go back to stakeholders and to do that research in theory. Um, so, you know, if you're like, oh, actually we should really, we should really invest in this kind of thing. Um, you know, like say that uni's moving from semesters to trimesters or something and, and you're kind of like, ah, oh, I feel like we should really think about this even more broadly. Maybe they'll do four terms, five terms, six terms, um, rather than just kind of building that in as like a, oh, just in case, um, which I think is a very slippery slope. You would actually go back to stakeholders and say, you know, we wanted to check about this. Is this at all feasible? And they might be like, maybe. Or they might be like, yeah, how'd you know? Or they might be like, uh, no, no way, absolutely not. No one, they'd be like, no one's ever done that in the world. There's no precedent for it. So we're not doing it, you know? So it, it's really like a go back to them to figure that out. Um, cause, cause the big thing in a lot of this, and this is where all this requirements and, and user stories comes back to is that things need to be properly motivated. You know, like I'm not, I'm not a big believer in software for software's sake. I think I think I think so much software is written poorly or it's deleted or it's never used or it becomes confusing or it becomes buggy that it's like you need to always make sure that what you're doing is properly motivated and and I, I would have this view more than probably a lot of other people particularly in academia but um, you know it's, it's just something I see all the time so it's like uh, an example again um, someone said to me the other day half changing up this example they were like oh um, we're using an older version of Flask. We should really upgrade our version of Flask. And I'm like, why? They're like, oh, because it's good to have newer versions. And it's like, why? Like, like what? Like why? And they're like, well, there might be some features there that are useful. And I'm like, well, upgrade it once you find these features. You know, don't don't just like, don't just kind of do things because you have a, you know, a suspicion about things. Actually, go and make sure there's a good reason to do it. Camille says, uh, if a client insists on a particular feature which you don't find matches with their problem. How do you finish the requirements analysis? Um, that's a good question. I'm answering some questions now. So just to be clear, we've talked about what a user story is. We'll run through a quick example of maybe making some in a sec, but I'll just answer Camille's question first. So again, if a client insists on a particular feature, which you don't, which you find doesn't match with their problem, how do you finish the requirements analysis? Um, that's hard. So let's say that um, someone has a problem like uh, I'm trying to think of what an, a good example of that would be. Um, say they want a messaging app, like you know your UNSW stream stuff, and you can tell that their problem is that uh, they want to be able to send direct messages, um, like group direct messages, and then you know. 
what happened? Oh, that's actually probably a good example. They're like, I want to be able to send group direct messages. I want to be able to pick like person, 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 and send them a direct message. And you're like, what's your problem? And they'll, you know, and you talk about it, and you realize that what they're trying to do is they're just trying to find an easy way to message a few people, um, and they want it to be a separate thing from channels. And you're like, well, it doesn't need to be separate. We could simplify all of this just by having d direct messages be a channel itself, right? Like when someone creates a DM, it just comes up as another channel. With the, but the, the the channel name is just the, you know, the DM name. And um, you might look at this, you might talk to them, and you think, "Oh, that's so stupid." Um, they just they just don't know the best way to solve this. They they have an inelegant solution. This happens all the time, and it also happens particularly with engineers because. As engineers, you probably don't realize how smart a lot of you are because you're, you're very analytical thinkers, you're very logical, you're very good problem solvers, even if you feel not that way sometimes. So there is a tendency to kind of want to override some of those ideas, but it really kind of comes down to how widespread it is. Um, if you're talking to 100 different users of your system or potential users, and 90 of them say, I want to have DMs and channels separate, and you say, you understand they're the same thing, right? They're just different names, kind of. They're like, yeah, I do, but it just makes sense to me. Well, you're building it for them. You might as well do it. You know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, most things you build are to make someone happy because if they're happy, you get more job, you get more money, you get more promotion, you get more rep. Like, you know, they're, they're there at the end of the day. Um, if one or two people are asking for it, you'd probably just say, I've listened. We think we found a... Um, uh, you know, a more elegant solution that most people seem to be satisfied with. And that's normal. That's normal to come back to people and say, I understand you wanted this, but that just wasn't what the research indicated to us. Um, yeah. And a lot of this stuff is covered. I, I think it's in Desen 2000 now. So that's good fun to watch. Um, yeah, the whole customer's always right thing. I, I don't you know, like, you read up on things, you know, I think Amazon, you'll see Jeff Bezos say stuff like, I hope he says it, uh, like, um, listen to the customer. Aggressive, you know, the, listen to the customer. And then you look at, like, you know, Steve Jobs quotes, and it'll be like, um, people don't know what they want. People need to be told what they want. Stuff like, like, I don't know the exact quotes, but you'll see that kind of stuff. And this is why I, I freaking hate quotes from uh, famous people and stuff, because it's like, they're both right. There's lots of times where I'm sure both companies has been very adaptive to people and both times where they've taken, you know, they've taken a stance on things. They've been opinionated. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, let's just have a quick example about user stories and like building a to-do list. Now, I think the to-do list problem is interesting to me because I think I would call it, I, call, I refer to it as the unsolved problem. Um, where... There are lots, there, there are unsolved product problems, I believe. And, you know, one of them that was interestingly solved to me was Slack and Teams and all of that. Because prior to 2015, right, um, Discord and all this stuff, well, not, I don't know how long Discord's been around. I know a bunch of them have been around a lot longer, but they, they didn't get very mainstream for a long time. Um, you know, it's only been like the last five or six years that they've really picked up. Um, well, yeah, Discord 2015 too. So Discord was released. I'm Googling this on another screen. Slack was uh, founded, like Slack was initially launched. I'm just looking this up now. 2013, Microsoft Teams, um, Wikipedia was launched. Who even knows? history 2017 like these are all very new software or, or pieces of software right um and before that there was nothing really there for it like really like it's kind of actually crazy sometimes i think about the um the fact that uh when i think back to like some group group stuff i used to do like everything we used to do was either emails or facebook chats, which is just like, if you told me to do anything with anyone via email or Facebook chat that was highly collaborative, I just like totally melt. Um, so I think, I think that problem was solved. Discord, Slack, they, they like solved the IM, the direct messaging problem. Um, 
what problem I think still isn't solved though is a lot of the uh, a lot of the to do list problems. I've never really seen a to do list app that has just like totally taken the market and everyone loves it. There's a whole bunch of them and some people like certain things and some people like other certain things, but there's just nothing that really like nails it. It's like fully integrated all of that. So we want, let's build a to-do list. So what I want you to do in the YouTube chat is I just want you to like think about a nice to-do list. Don't don't tell me user stories. I'll help you, I'll help write them for, for it. Um, but I just want you to tell me like, what do you like in a to-do list? When you think about a really good to-do list, what do you, what do you think it has? You know, how does it make you feel and like why? It's like, tell me a few things in the chat. While you're typing that, I'm just going to respond to um, a couple of the other comments. So like, uh, Justin says it's very similar to branding logo design. Customers think they know better. Yeah, that's true. Izzy says, um, uh, yep, yeah, it's very, it's very difficult with, um, things like games and stuff too because pe people complain if things don't change people complain if things change I mean I, I see this in teaching you eventually get used to it you know people people are annoyed about everything so um, okay so I'm going to write some of these down let me just open up just open up a fresh window for us to write into we'll write some user stories together just going to copy some of these in um, I will only copy another few for now. Okay, I'm just Luca. Luca's the last one I'll copy. So, oh, red. Oh, I feel so bad. I feel so bad. Not ah, okay. I'm, I'm actually going to stop now. I'm sorry. We're only going to be able to do so many, but let's have a look at some of these, right? So, um, Hussein says, reject to do list, return to yeah, I'll remember this. Are you just saying we don't want a to-do list? Is that what you mean? I don't know. Okay, I'm just gonna get on that. Um, marker on hand, Beth, okay. Well, fair enough. Like, well, again, you know, in theory, you should start this and say like, you know, is an app really the best way to do this? But let's assume we're doing an app for a second or some kind of, some kind of digital tool. So I think it's great that there's, you know, a bit of like a, using a marker and pen and paper because sometimes that is the best answer. But let's say we are trying to create a, billion dollar business with like totally everything etc um you know vincent says i like the ability to organize the tasks visually um okay so you know and most most of these things are like who are you you know the hardest part of a user story for most of um uh for most i guess students in this course because we asked you to do this as part of iteration three is they say who's the the type of user like i get the whole goal and i get the whole reason but like who's the type of user well it depends what the context is right like in the in the context of all of you i'm asking you probably as university students because that's what most of your life is entailed but different people might have kind of different backgrounds so i might say as a uni student um i want to organize i want to organize my tasks visually i don't know to do not sure not sure what vincent not sure what Vincent, uh, why that matters to Vincent. I'd be curious. Vincent can probably tell us. Um, Camille says, you know, as a uni student, I want to be able to check boxes off. And I'm just going to make the assumption here um, because it's motivating. Something like that. You know, that's, that's the main reason I think most people want to check things off. Um, yeah, it makes you feel satisfied when you complete a task. So I can see here, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just mark these as like... Um, uh, how many people, right? So let's just call this person, like one person. As a uni student, I want to be able to check boxes off um, because it's motivating. It's because it's motivating and satisfying. I want to be able to check items off. I should call it items, right? You don't want to call it boxes because boxes is more constraining, right? You don't want it to be feature oriented. You want it to be goal oriented. Um, I want to be able to, or even better, mark items as complete. Now that's a pretty obvious one. So two people kind of have touched on that. Uh, if I make a to-do list, I never look at it again. Ability to break down tasks into subtasks. Okay, so Fu, as a uni student, again, I'm not sure what the motivation here is, right? I want to be uh, able to break tasks into sub-components um, to, to organize my complex 
I'm just making this one up because I can't go back to all of you. Um, I don't know, to organize my complex tasks. I don't know what you call it. Proper calendar integration. As a uni student, I want to uh, integrate with my calendar. This is the kind of thing that you would kind of go back to someone and be like, well, what does that mean? Like, what do you mean by integrate with calendar? Like, if you gave that to someone, they'd be like, what? So you'd have to kind of go back to the stakeholder, who in this case, and be like, well, why? Um, Gorbs also said the same thing. Crystal said reminders. Um, able to open from any app with the single keyboard shortcut. I like that one. As a uni student, I'd be curious on the why again. I want to open the app from... I want to open it anywhere with one keyboard shortcut so that I don't know what the motivation here so that it's easy to quickly jot something down before I forget now I'm just going to stop there for a sec because I'm, I'm hoping this has kind of demonstrated things a little bit and I think a few of you have probably uh, you know it's so funny um, uh, Brian about um, the whole, I want to make a, uh, make tasks repeat every X days. It's like, this is literally my problem right now because there's these like, there's these like things I have to do every day and I've literally tried to like write a whiteboard for it. And I'm like, this is so annoying because I just want to check it off. And then every day I wake up, I want the check boxes to disappear. But it's like, I'm not going to rub them off every day. I'm just going to forget. So like, you know, this is why it's interesting because different people are different. They have different needs. And if you ask this broadly enough, you can start to actually paint a picture of what it is. And this is requirements analysis. This is, you're eliciting stuff. I copied it down. Think about that like step one. Step two is actually an analyzing it now. It's just that what's happening this time is that as part of that requirements engineering, right? This analysis you're doing with user stories. You're trying to write it in a particular structure. Google Calendar Tasks for repetition. Thank you, Blake. I'll look into that. That's a good idea. So hopefully I've demonstrated, uh, that's okay, I'll need to do it every day anyway. Um, hopefully I've demonstrated that well enough. Um, when it comes to user stories, we wanna ask ourselves a more important question too, which is like, how do we validate user stories? Um, how do we like, how do we know we've met the requirement? You know, so we write a user story down, how do we actually like know if we've met the requirement? now? A big part of this, funnily enough, is actually writing better user stories. If you write a good user story, it's really easy to tell whether you've met the requirement because it's just so straightforward. So testing how you've met the requirement is actually like somewhat easy, we'll get to in a sec. Um, but in the meantime, we want to focus on just writing a good requirement. Now, what's a bad user story? This one, I want to integrate with a calendar. This is a bad user story because it, it, every requirement you write needs to be testable. If you can't look at a requirement and think, I know how to test this, I know how to check it, be like, yep, that's, that's done, um, you can't achieve it, right? So, we need to think about our user stories in this invest framework, which is that user stories should be independent. They should be as small as possible. Um, you know, like if you shouldn't lump them together, they should be negotiable as in they should avoid too much detail because if they avoid too much detail, you're going to constrain your solutions. Um, they should be valuable, which means they should hold some value to the client because if they don't, then the client's never going to care if you do it. So it needs to matter to the client. They should be estimatable. Um, we actually don't cover this anymore in the course. I, I should update that. But estimatable is kind of like you should be able to have a sense of how much work is involved in them. Uh, they should be small too, uh, so that they uh, aren't too big and too broad. The small one kind of comes back to this. This isn't really a small thing. Like integrate with a calendar, it's either unspecific or it's not, like it's too big. Um, and then lastly, they should be testable. Now, testable's an interesting one because like literally every time someone gives you a requirement, you should be thinking, how do I test this? Whether it's a user story or not. If you can't, if you can't figure out how to test if it's happened, you shouldn't like, you shouldn't do it. Like, it's just a bad requirement. Sorry, um, paracetamol. So it's like, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the crux of it. Um, 
They should be small so they aren't big. Yeah, they should be small so they aren't big. They, it's, it's kind of funny because in general they need to be small but not specific. Not, not too detailed, sorry. So you want them to be like these small little nuggets but not like overtly like you have to do exactly this because you want to leave room for designers and engineers to figure some things out. And on the testable front, it's like, well, you look at these, it's like, I want to organize my tasks visually. Yeah, that's kind of testable. You could probably give someone an app and say, do you feel like you can organize these tasks just by playing around with it? Um, you know, I want to be able to mark items as complete. That's clearly testable. Uh, break tasks into subcomponents. Yeah, that's that's testable. Um, integrate with a calendar, maybe open it anywhere with a keyboard shortcut. Yeah, that's also kind of testable. Um, Blake says, wouldn't give it to a user and see if they like it always work as a test. Um, so that's a good question, Blake says. It's kind of like, you know, we've got all these little mini things that we say should be testable. Why don't we just give them the finished app and we say, do, do you like it? And they go, I love this. And you're like, great, we did our job. The reason you got to be careful there is because um, that does not help you derive which, which of these user stories actually had an impact and which didn't. Um, because some people could love an app but maybe they don't care about a particular thing you did. And from like a, an engineering management point of view, it's really important to understand like, like whether what you do has an impact. Because otherwise you're just coding blind. Like if what you've written, if you've written code that works, that doesn't actually have an impact, it's pointless code a lot of the time, right? So that's the kind of thing to be, um, uh, you know, thoughtful of. The last thing here is, um, <coughs> just kind of glancing through this. Uh, the last thing here on user stories is just around user acceptance criteria. Um, user acceptance criteria is something that you write as part of a user story to help kind of define the tests. So I mentioned before that a user story should be testable. Well, it should be testable because you know what to test and user acceptance criteria are essentially criteria that you can test against um, that you write in like fairly natural language. So as an example, if I use a story here that says, as a user, I wanna use a search field to type a city name or street so that I can find matching hotel options. That's the user story, it's kind of broad, but how do I tell if it's successful? So what's this testable component, this part up here that I wrote in bold? Well, we can write some user acceptance criteria underneath, <coughs> underneath that that says things like, the search field's placed on the top bar. Search starts once the user clicks search. The field contains a placeholder with gray colored text. Where are you going? The placeholder disappears once the user starts typing, etc. Now, this might be done by a designer. This might be done somewhat after the requirement stage. And you can actually see this here. It breaks down a user story into criteria that must be met. It's written in natural language and it can be refined again before the implementation. So sometimes you might write a little bit of this. You might write none of it. You might write a lot of it. This is important because it's very hard to test things like I want to organize my tasks visually because this might be made up of a few different pieces of criteria like I want to be able to reorder reorder my tasks I want to be able to drag and drop into recycling to remove a task um, I want to be able to insert a task between any other tasks. You know, you don't always want to insert them at the end and drag them up. You know, and some of this you can actually d derive from um, customers as well. You know, sometimes you could argue that this might be for the design team to actually figure out what they think defines success, or you could uh, say that it's part of the requirements, part of the elicitation, part of the talking to customers here. Um, so that's what a user acceptance criteria are. They're just ways to kind of break up a user story into clear testable points. Um, your acceptance criteria should not be too broad. They should actually be like quite specific as the example I gave before it might be a little bit specific, but even then it's like, the better to be specific because this is the actual testable part of what you're doing. So someone needs to be able to meaningfully test it. The actual testing of this is what we often call user acceptance testing. Um, back in week three, when we talked about verification, we talked about unit tests, integration tests, system tests, and then user acceptance testing or just acceptance tests. Um, and this is where you would actually sit a, a, a customer down or a user down and, 
and give them your criteria and maybe say, you know, tell us if you think you can do all these things. Tell us if this meets it. And then you might ask them to, you know, do you feel like you can actually organize this? Sometimes the actual criteria might be all a tick, but they say, I still don't feel that way, you know? So again, it's very human. These are loose structures. Uh, different organizations would deal with these things differently as well. Some of them would do it very loosely. Some of them would not do it at all. Some of them would do it in like, they literally follow a textbook or something. Um, so, you know, best practices is just, they can't be too broad. Um, and they're generally going to be more technical and specific than the actual story itself. I've just kind of talked about this. Um, I jumped ahead here a sec. So it's like I mentioned acceptance tests are there to uh, ensure that the acceptance criteria have been met. So, you know, acceptance testing is the process of checking the acceptance criteria has been met. Pretty straightforward. Because user acceptance tests are super high level, they're obviously black box tests because actual users using your system, um, they're barely even going to understand how it works, right? Um, let alone looking at functions or anything like that. Uh, some other examples are like, as another user story, you might say, as a user, I can log in. I want to be able to log in through a social media account because I always forget my passwords. I love this user story because it's really simple, right? Why do people like Google sign in, Facebook sign in, LinkedIn sign in, Apple sign in, whatever other sign ins, Office Outlook, Microsoft sign in? Um, it's because they don't like remembering passwords, right? Um, so that's a good user story. And then the acceptance criteria might be, can the user log in via Facebook? Can they log in via LinkedIn? Can they log in via Twitter? So that one might be a little bit simpler and like a little clearer cut for you. So when you're actually testing that with someone, you need that criteria because your design team and your engineering team are going to obviously implement some of these. Um, and you need to know which ones to implement. And you can implement the ones that will allow you to pass the criteria. Where did this list come from? Well, ideally it would have come from talking to, to customers. So maybe you survey them. Maybe you survey a thousand customers and you say, which of these services do you tend to log in through the most? And you notice that the most popular ones are Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. You know, that accounts for like 95% of customers can log in with one of those three things. So, you know, as a team, you're like, that's our requirements. Now, there we go. It's in our user story. It's in our criteria. Hand it off to some designers. You don't care how it looks. That's the designer's job. You don't care how it's built. That's an engineering job, uh, etc. Now, in terms of the acceptance criteria we've given before, uh, like this one here, these were very these were very factual. These were very much just like can do that, can do that, can do that. Um, I also just want to quickly talk about scenario based acceptance criteria. The reason I want to talk about this is not because it's like there's two ways to do it or something. It's because I'm trying to demonstrate to you that there's a big, rich canon of ways people deal with this. Um, some people would just write it like this. Other people would be quite adamant on that our acceptance criteria should be describing things in the given when then syntax. Given when then is like given a setting when an action happens, there's a result. You know, so now an acceptance criteria for say this user story, as a user, I want to be able to recover the password to my account so that I will be able to access my account in case I forgot the password. Okay. Is that a good user story? Maybe. A couple of things that I don't love about it are, you know, the able to recover the password to my account. As you've all kind of probably learned, that's generally considered bad practice. So maybe you talk to the customer and say, wait, sorry, do you, do you want to get your password or do you just, you just want to be able to change it if you forgot it? And they're like, oh, I'd change it. I, yeah, I just need to be able to log in. And you're like, oh, cool. Okay. So that would maybe change how the user story is written, right? I want to be able to... Um, gain access to my, like maybe a, user story, a better user story here is as a user, I want to be able to gain access to my account if I've forgotten my password because I forget my passwords regularly. That might better capture the requirement. You know, that's why this is a very human intellectual process. But in terms of the user acceptance criteria here in the scenario based, this one's written as like the scenario is that I've forgotten my password. So given a setting where the user's navigated to the login page, and then they've realized they've forgotten their password. Um, and they've entered a valid email to receive a link for password recovery. Then the system should send them a link to the, to the entered email to, to get their password. Also, given when the user received that link via email, when they navigate to the link received in that email, they should be able to set a new password. You know, some people would say that this is kind of a lot more readable. 
paints a better story, which we're about to talk about with use cases too. Um, Blake says, are acceptance criteria always objective things? They're always testable things. I don't, I don't really, I don't really know how to answer that in terms of is it objective, but they're always testable things in terms of, um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't really know how to say objective or subjective there because it's just you could argue there might be some subjective subjective things that are like what's an example of a subjective thing you're probably getting at? Is that thing like the user feels happy, you know, like the user feels relieved. You know, when the user, you know, then the system enables them to set their new password, then they feel relieved. Um, I think generally you'd probably avoid that sometimes because how do you test that? Survey them. It's doable, right? Like you give them a pop-up after they reset their password. How do you feel? They'd probably be like, what? Thank you. Close. Skip. Um, so, you know, maybe is the short answer. Uh, you just got to use some common sense with whatever it is. So in terms of these examples, um, you know, should you use this, what we call rule-based acceptance criteria, which are the ones where we just wrote like, you know, has to do this, has to do that, have to do, has to do this and that and this, or should you use like scenario-based uh, acceptance criteria? Dunno, depends what you're doing. You know what? Some companies do unit testing, start similar to what you do with, um, you've done with PyTest. Other companies do behavior-based testing uh, or scenario-based testing where they actually literally write tests in terms of like, here's the setup, here's the action, here's the result we expect in a very structured way. So, you know, you get to use which one you think makes the most sense or more likely which one that people smarter than you think is more appropriate for a particular environment you're working, um, working in. There's a whole bunch of other reading you can do here. You don't have to. I generally tell you when I think links are worth absolutely clicking on, like I did with the functional, non-functional. This is just here in case people have some more questions. Now, on to the last part of this uh, lecture today, which is on use cases. Use cases are a, another way of um, representing... Use cases are a way of essentially describing a scenario. Right, so is this like a different kind of user story? Not really, maybe, kind of. These are all tools that help you effectively communicate requirements and, and how a system should be or how we intend for it to be interacted with. Use cases are a dialogue between a user and a system that helps people understand what that interaction is, right? It typically consists of a series of actions and reactions between what you'd call agents or individuals. Um, what's an example of that? Well, it depends how you want to do it. We're going to look through a written example and a diagrammatic example. There's lots of other ways people might write it. Again, there's a whole spectrum of, of uh, approaches to this. But let's start with the diagrammatic style because this is arguably something that's kind of a little bit more maybe natural to you because it's how you picture it. Let's say you're designing an ATM. Right? Someone says, I need you to build an ATM and you're trying to come up with a set of requirements to help you understand the nature of the system. It's like, okay. Well, you might go and figure out all these things like, you know, how much cash? What's the maximum cash you need? What are all the different things you need to do? Maybe you could write these down as user stories. Um, the one other tool that's really useful is use case diagrams where you actually can, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to like make cartoons or whatever, but you know, it's like, here is like a storyboard where it's like, Someone comes up to a machine, it asks them to enter their PIN, the user types in their PIN, right? The machine goes and talks to a company server that says verify this account. The company server responds and says, yep, there's the balance. The machine comes back and says, hey, I'm good. How can I help? The person says, I'd like to withdraw $60. The machine says, here's your cash. The person grabs, you know what I mean? Like you're telling us like it's a scenario. It's actually very similar to what we saw back um, uh, here where it was like, you know, given this, when that happens, do this and, and so forth. So it's really just a way of describing behavior in a system. Now, why do you need this? Why did, you know, why would you ever want this? Maybe requirements are enough. Maybe user stories are enough. Well, whatever you think you need to adequately communicate and document the goals of the system, maybe this is included, you know? I use use case diagrams sometimes. I don't do them like this. I'll often do them as flow charts and stuff because um, I don't want to draw little kind of weird looking people with coats and top hats. Not top hats? Is that a top hat? 
I can't even remember what a top hat is, and briefcases and whatnot. Um, but it's just another tool to help you communicate how a system should function. Now, you can also use a written form of um, use cases if you want to. So, you know, rather than be like, here's a diagram, you could actually say, well, here's what we de deem as a successful scenario. Step one, ATM asks customer for PIN. Customer enters the PIN. ATM talks to the bank to verify it. Bank responds and gives you the balance. Custom, uh, ATM says to the customer what action should take. Step six, customer asks to withdraw an amount of money. Seven's dispense. Eight's the ATM tells the bank. Now, is this better or worse? Who knows? It's different. It's not going to be as useful for visual people, naturally. The good thing about this is it's a lot more specific too. You can actually get into some specificity here and some detail. One of the downsides though is you do often lose a sense of the agents involved in something like this. Another way you might draw these diagrams is you might draw them, I can't remember what the name of these are, but you might draw them like you say, here is the customer, here is the ATM, and here is the bank. You know, and what actually happens is that you know, you start off and you're like, well, the customer talks to the ATM and then the ATM talks to the bank, then the bank talks to the ATM and then the ATM talks to the customer, and then the customer talks to the ATM who gives them their cash and then the ATM talks to the bank. And you might write something on top of all of these, right? Like customer um, enters PIN or something like this. Sometimes these diagrams are super useful because these, these, these are most useful when you are trying to actually give a better feel for the participants involved and the interactions between the participants more than the detail of the interactions. You know, this might tell a story in, in just a different way. Um, so, you know, there is no better or worse here. They're just kind of different ways of going about these things. Um, Camille says, are use cases or user stories more commonly used? Um, they're kind of just used for different purposes. Like user stories might be there to capture a whole bunch of stuff. Um, like a whole set of requirements. Use cases, use cases would probably be there more to uh, paint together a bigger story or explain a complex set of interactions. Because the thing about things like user stories is that they're all like atomic, right? They're all like, here's the thing. It's, it would be really hard to describe this in a user story. You could describe it as like four user stories, but then you lose a sense of the, the narrative, ironically, right? You lose a sense of the story. Um, or you could write a big user story saying as a customer, I want to be able to withdraw money from the ATM so that I can get cash to buy things. And maybe your acceptance criteria actually outlines some of these key steps. Um, so, you know, it's no real answer about which is more commonly used. They're all just tools. And the reason I like to teach it this way too is because like, I don't like the idea of being like, you know, here's the two methods to do this and here's the whatever to do this. It's like, no, no, even you have a problem to solve, which is you need to communicate a set of requirements without losing information. You could do that other ways too. There's, uh, you know, that I wouldn't have even thought about. Blake says, how comprehensive would uh, be the use cases since there's often hundreds of possible interactions with the system? That's a really excellent question. So. Typically, when we describe use cases in general, which also tend to fall into testing, we have what we might call the happy flow or the primary flow or the success, the main success scenario or something like this, which kind of dictates, you know, what is just the standard interaction people have, right? Like you've gone to the ATM, you've put in your card, it asks your PIN, you enter your PIN, it asks you how much cash you want, you type it in, you get the cash out, you go away. So you can always usually write a use case for like that main flow. Um, do you need to write a use case for every type of different permutation? Probably not. You could take a diagram like this and you could maybe annotate it. You could maybe say, you know what? Um, at this stage here, B, um, perhaps the pin's wrong. You know, maybe you need to do a flow for the wrong pin and a flow for the insufficient balance. Maybe you only need three. Maybe you could just have one and again, annotate it. Like a few different ways you could go about it. But no, generally there's no expectation that you kind of produce hundreds of these or anything like that. Typically, it'll only be one or two. And a lot of the time as well, the aim of a use case diagram or text is not to describe all the possibilities because you can handle that through just kind of written requirements. It's to communicate a lot of the time. It's so that someone looking at this is like, oh, I get it. Because what did we say? What did we say back in um, uh, this lecture here, right? Um, 
at the end, we said, one of the challenges was developers might not understand the subject domain. That's another reason we like these use case diagrams. I was talking to a, uh, to a company that does banking a month or so ago, and they were telling us how easy it was to work with our team because we were all local Australians. And the reason for that wasn't racism or anything. It was because they were saying that when they work with other teams, particularly in Southeast Asia, like Manila, um, they don't get Australia's banking system. So they don't actually have a sense of the flow. They're all very talented people, but they don't actually, like they've never had an Australian bank account and have seen direct debits happen and seen deposits happen and BSB account numbers. They have different names for it, right? Like in the US it's routing numbers and various other things. So it's like sometimes use case diagrams are simply there not to, you know, maybe it's, maybe this is already captured elsewhere, but it's a communication tool where someone's like, oh, okay, I've never used an ATM before. I get it now. That makes sense. Um, Vincent says, so use the stories and acceptance criteria that outline the requirements whilst use cases there to show how the solution will behave to satisfy these requirements. That's a good question too. Um, <clears throat> maybe. This one's really hard. I, I actually had a hard time with this lecture because I think user stories unambiguously fall into the requirements category. Sure, some acceptance criteria you could argue might be a design decision. Um, but you know, this is not, these aren't siloed things, right? This is a fluid process. Use cases I found hard because I think, you know, some people would say that it's in the design category where maybe these are captured elsewhere, where the requirement is just, oh, I want to be able to get cash from an ATM. I want it to be secured with my PIN. If they don't have enough balance, it gets rejected. If the PIN's incorrect, it gets rejected. They should be able to print print their receipt, no receipt, or view it on the screen. Maybe that's the requirements. And that could be captured with user stories. And then maybe someone takes that and says, let's actually build this system. Let's design this system. And then that person actually writes this out and they're like, this is my design for the ATM to meet those requirements, right? So the short answer there is like, it depends, right? Because you could draw, like these are just diagrams. Like I call them use case diagrams, but they're just, they're just diagrams that tell a story or they're just text that tells a story. That story could be derived from like, this has to be done in this way. Maybe there's regulatory reasons for it. Maybe this is how all ATMs need to work in Australia, for instance. They all need to ask for the pin. They all need to like check this. So maybe it is just part of the requirements and it's not really part of design, you could argue. And that, you know, people, when they start designing it, they're like, oh, well, this is how it has to work. Or this is what, you know, it has to do. Or maybe this is part of the design where people have said, this is our intelligent way to meet these requirements. So it would depend on the system. Um, yeah. Uh, use case written form. Um, this kind of goes into some more depth, but you know, it's mainly here just for illustrative purposes. Like uh, you could also give backgrounds on your use cases as well. Um, if you were to give multiple ones, like I, d I don't really do this a lot, but I mean, again, cause normally like if you gave this use case, you're going to give some kind of context around it. Like how much money does the customer have? How much money does the ATM have? Um, are probably two obvious questions here, right? Um, how much does the customer withdraw? Because there's nothing here about um, insufficient funds, right? So either you need to add that to part of the use case here to deal with insufficient funds, make a separate use case, or probably what you would do is make a separate use case. And this one is the use case for user tries to withdraw less than they have in their bank. You know, so you can give some background to a given use case, particularly written ones. You could also do this for diagrammatic ones as well. Um, yeah. Um, there's some more reading on use cases as well. Um, I was going to spend some time today uh, doing a thing where we try and actually write out a set of requirements for UNSW's monorail. I just have this very fond memory of this, this article because back in 2012, the, the ARC, Put out a put out a, an article that was like in July that was like UNSW is building a monorail from the bottom of campus to the top of campus and everyone thought it was real um, and then I think some news news actual news companies picked up on it and it was very funny so 
I just thought, well, wouldn't it be funny to actually um, sit down together and write out a list of requirements or use cases or user stories for what a monorail system would look like? Um, maybe we don't even need use cases. Maybe we could just have some requirements. Maybe we don't even need user stories. We probably do some user stories, but it's two minutes till the end of the lecture, so we're not going to do that today. Uh, we'll do that maybe in a later week if we have some spare time. It's not really critical. It's just a chance to actually put these some of these things into action anyway. So, um, any hoot. Uh, thank you all for today. And I guess I'll see you all tomorrow morning where we'll be talking about decorators. So a bit of Python tomorrow. Um, and iteration three. And if we have time, some teamwork Thursday stuff. So um, please pause the video, leave some feedback, and thank you. <laughs>